Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service. It's lovely to see you here this morning. Uh, it's good to be together today. We've got the communion table set. We're going to be sharing the Lord's Supper later on in our service this morning. Uh, Miles is away preaching this morning, and Ruth's gone to go and support him, so uh, we've got no uh, music this morning, uh, but we've, it's going to be on the DVDs on the screen, so all the words uh, will be up on the screen for us this morning. As we begin our service, let's just quieten our hearts and bow and come and pray with to the Lord this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've made. We rejoice and are glad in it. And we thank you for the opportunity to meet together in the name of Jesus Christ, to give glory and honour to you. Father, we pray this morning that you will open our lips to declare your praises, that you'll warm our hearts, that you'll draw us near to yourself as you draw near to us. And we pray, Father, that as we open up your word together this morning, you will delight to speak to us through the power of your spirit. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to begin our service this morning by singing a couple of songs. And the first is a psalm of praise, all creatures of our God and King. Lift up your voice and with us sing hallelujah. It points us to our creator God. It points us to Jesus, our redeemer, the one who reigns and one day will return. We're going to sing all creatures of our God and King and then remain standing to sing the splendour of the King. So if you're able, please stand and we'll sing together. to 
something this morning that would fit in with the theme where I'm looking at 1 Philippians as well as John um, and concentrating on verse 6 and so I thought here's our first slide who can tell me who that is Benjamin that's right Mr Todd and Jemima Puddled up now Benjamin you love this program don't you 
Thank you so much, Sam. Well, the work God's begun in us has happened because Christ has died and Christ has been raised. And our next song takes us to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, where 
where Jesus bore our sins, where Jesus paid the price for us so we can praise his name this morning. The song says, his dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. So let's stand and worship him as we sing together how deep the Father's love for us. Well, apart from the boys and girls who are heading out with uh, Samantha, so if you want to go on out with Samantha, we will see you later on. As they're leaving us here, in a moment or two, we're going to have our Bible reading from the book of Philippians. Geraldine will bring us to that to us in a moment. Uh, but before that, Theo is going to come and lead us this morning in our prayers. Thank you, Theo. Let's pray. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your creation and for your global church. We thank you for all that you provide and all the gifts you have given us. We give thanks for family, friends, homes, and all the things we so often take for granted. Remind us, Lord, to always remember how undeserving we are of all that you have provided. Make us truly thankful for all the joys of life, for health, relationships, education, and edu employment. Let us focus on all the riches of your grace and love. Lord, we thank you for your presence in every situation, even though it may not look that way to us. We ask that we put our trust not in people or worldly things, but in you alone. 
As we see so many tragedies across the world, Lord, we ask for your hand to be evident. Help those in war-torn countries. Let the fighting cease and peace return. In our community and further afield, we pray for healing and restoration of the sick. Please provide comfort to them. In countries where famine, drought or flooding are present, we pray that you give those people strength and endurance, and that the months or years of difficulty will pass. We pray especially for Christians across the globe facing difficulty or persecution, that they will still earnestly gather together and praise your name. Father, we pray that every one of us will not be ashamed of you. We ask for wisdom, strength and guidance in talking about and sharing the gospel. As we look to your word this morning, please forgive us for our shortcomings. Forgive us where we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves, or loved you with our heart, mind and soul. Lord, let us be devoted to our relationship with you. Make us eager to pray and to read your word. Let us learn from it. Lord, soften our hearts this morning to your word, allowing our lives to be changed by you. We ask that you give John wisdom this morning and that you will speak through him. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The reading can be found in Philippians chapter 1. That's on page 1178 in the Church Bibles. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all saints in Jesus Christ at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers to all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have heard you in my since I have you in my heart. For whether I am in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. Thank you so much, Geraldine, for our reading, and thank you, Theo, for leading us in our prayers this morning. Please keep your Bibles open with me at uh, Philippians chapter 1, as we continue our series this morning in the book of Philippians. If you remember, we started a couple of weeks ago, and we've looked at the opening few verses, and then we've looked last week from verses 3 uh, down to 8, and this morning we're going to be looking at those verses at the end that Geraldine just read to us, verses 9, 10, and 11. And they teach us about prayer this morning. So I want to ask you, I wonder what you pray for. Perhaps as you uh, pray quietly on your own each day, perhaps as you pray with others, what do you pray for? Well, Jesus teaches us what to pray for, doesn't he? He teaches us to pray for God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. He teaches us to pray for our daily bread, to pray for the forgiveness of our sins, for deliverance from temptation and evil. So perhaps we'll pray those things and you'll go, yes. Those are the kind of things I pray. Maybe also we pray for workers to go out into the harvest field. We pray for those that we know and love to become Christians. We pray for one another, especially those struggling, as we've done this morning. But recently we've been learning to pray other things, haven't we? At our prayer meeting a couple of weeks ago, we looked at 1 Thessalonians and Paul's prayer for the Christians there, giving thanks for their faith and their love and their hope. 
And even last week, as we looked at the earlier verses in Philippians chapter 1, we saw Paul thanking God for these Christians and their gospel partnership. Lots of things to pray for. Well, this morning, we're going to learn another prayer. A prayer of Paul's here for these Philippian Christians who he knows and he loves. And he prays three things for them that we're going to see. For a greater love, that they'll make good choices, and in doing so, will glorify God. And I hope this morning as we look at this, and perhaps you've got that on sermon handout sheets, so you can follow that along, it'll really help us to develop and grow in our prayers for one another, because we might sometimes wonder, well, what can I pray for you? Well, we can pray these things, as we'll see this morning, for a greater love that will make good choices so that we might glorify God. Well, let's look at the first of those then in verse 9. Uh, a greater love, Paul prays for a greater love, and this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. His petition for them is that their love might grow, and that their love wouldn't just be a brotherly love, but it would be a, a sacrificial love, a greater love, a pure love, a love that is pure and selfless, a love that's unconditional, a love that's undeserved and gracious, a love that is just poured out for others, a love of choice, not because it's been earned or deserved, not because they're, they're particularly nice people. Oh, well, I'll pray for you because I like you. Or, well, I don't know about praying for you. Well, I'll pray for that person. No, it's a love that just pours itself out in grace towards other people. It's the, the love of God that we see in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, do you notice there in verse 9, the, the object of their love isn't stated? Is it a love for God or is it a love for people that he's praying for? Well, well, surely if it's going to be that, that agape love, it's going to be both of those things, isn't it? Because as we, as we see and know God's love, we'll love him more, and out of that we will have this deep love for one another. It's what Jesus taught us, to, to love God and to love others. Or listen to 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. So, so the love he's praying for that might abound more and more, surely it's got to be both a, a love for God and a love for God's people. Now the struggle is, I think, that, that that agape love doesn't come naturally to us as sinners. We're not naturally disposed, disposed to, to love like that, but it does come naturally from God. It's an integral part of him, so as we draw closer to God and know his love, then we can show that love not only to God, but also to one another. So Paul's prayer is that your love may abound more and more. I want that love in you to grow. Now, just stop for a moment to think what we've already learned about these Philippian Christians. They are really loving people. They've cared for Paul both when he was with them and when he went on to Thessalonica. They've sent him money. They sent him Epaphroditus. They couldn't be more loving. It's a, it might be a bit of a strange prayer request. I, I pray your love will grow more and more. But actually what he's saying is that your love... Your love doesn't have a limit. You've not got to, well, I've got this amount of love. I've, I've got love buttoned down. Tick that off the list. Yeah, I don't need, to, don't need any more love. Now you're saying, look, my, your love can grow more and more and more. It should be abounding. It should be flourishing. And what he's praying is that this love is a, a gift of grace from God. And I pray that it wouldn't just stay static. That you've got a good amount of love. But that you'd have more love. You would abound in love. Your love for God, your love in your relationship with God would grow and deepen. Your love in relationship with one another would also grow and flourish. So now that we've had some rain, an abundance of rain, the, the allotment's out the back of us. Not, not only is the produce growing, but the grass is growing, especially on those, those plots that haven't been tended. In fact, there's a, there's a working party this morning we saw. They're getting out the strimmers because the grass that was sort of knee height has grown to waist height and is now about head height on some of those plots and they're going to be they're going to be strimming for more than this morning uh, they're going to be along with it the, the grass is abounding because it's had the rain and the sunshine and that's the kind of picture of our love for god and for one another it should grow and develop not just be that high or this high but keep on growing and paul's prayer for them is that your love for god and for one another would abound would be a big thing would grow what a great thing to pray but that's not where his prayer ends in verse 9. Your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. So to the love, he wants to add knowledge and depth of insight. 
Why does he pray for knowledge? Well, he's not praying that it would be general knowledge, you know, that you can win a pub quiz and you'll, you'll get all the questions right on how to be a millionaire. You'll enter the 1% club and you'll be the, the cleverest person. No, knowledge in the Bible is, 20 times in the New Testament, it is the knowledge of God. The knowledge of his being, of his truth, of his ways. Knowing who God is, knowing what he's like. Knowing that our Father in heaven is faithful and unchanging and true and trustworthy. As we know him and grow in that knowledge of him. As we understand that he's compassionate and kind and gracious. That he's our Father in heaven. As that knowledge grows, that'll help our love to abound more and more. But it's not just knowledge, he says. It's also a depth of insight. He wants them to be discerning in the world that we live in. In fact, if you look over to chapter 3 and verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs, those men who do evil, those mutilators of the flesh. Watch out. Be discerning. Be wise. Don't uncritically accept everything. Stand firm against error. So I want your love to abound more and more, but I want it to abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight as well. Do you see how those three go together? You can't have one without the other. If you had love, but no knowledge or depth of insight, then, then your love might just end up being sentimentalism. It'll be a love when I, when I feel like it, or if I've got out the right side of bed. It'll be a love that ignores beliefs and, and lifestyle. No, the love's got to be joined in with the knowledge and the insight. But if I just had the knowledge without the love or the insight, then I could end up being proud or uncaring. It could be quite ugly, that. That could be very... I've got very sound knowledge, but I've got no love. Or if it was insight without love and knowledge, it could be harsh or arrogant. It could be proud and self-centred. No, his prayer is that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. What a great thing to pray for one another. Could we pray for one another that our, our love would grow and abound more and more, both for God and for each other, for other Christians... For God's world. Perhaps that we could pray that love will grow more and more in knowledge and depth of insight too. He prays for a greater love. He prays for a greater love so that, verse 10, they would make good choices. Verse 10, so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. He wants them to have the ability to discern what is best, to approve, to distinguish, to, to make wise spiritual decisions. Because we don't always make wise spiritual decisions. In fact, we're bombarded with decisions, aren't we? We're bombarded with decisions every day. And you can fit them into different categories. I've put them into three. You get, you get right and wrong decisions. Things that are revealed in God's word that are just right or wrong. Then you get matters of good judgment. Things that are best or, or second best. And then you've got matters of, of triviality. So we went to a garden centre um, for coffee recently. Don't worry, we did buy some plants. Yeah, plants in the plural. And uh, they look very nice. You can see they're at the front of the house. Uh, but we, had, we went for coffee. And there's three decisions to make. There's right and wrong decisions. There's, there's good and, and, and second best decisions. There's matters of triviality. There's right and wrong decisions. So they, they give you your coffee and your cake and then they give you a slip of paper and say, will you pay at the till on the way out? Well, they were really busy. And I didn't feel like disturbing them. You know, you could just slip out to the rest of the garden centre. No one would know whether you paid or not. But, but that's a right or wrong decision, isn't it? Don't worry, we, 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 made, we made one of those decisions. Um, there's right or wrong. There, there's, there's good and, and, and better decisions, aren't there? So there's a range of cakes. Well, should I have one cake or three cakes? Well, yeah, well I could have three. Can I? Well, there's a, there's a good decision to make. There's a better decision to make. And then there's matters of triviality. Well, do I have the, do I have the coffee cake or the lemon drizzle cake or the chocolate cake? Actually, you know the answer to that one, don't you? Okay, should I have the chocolate cake, the chocolate brownie, or the chocolate fudge cake? You know, those, are, those kind of choices. It just doesn't matter, does it? So do you see there's right and wrong? It, it does matter if I scoff stuff and steal it. That matters. It doesn't matter what kind of cake I make, but the, the decision I think Paul's talking about here is that middle bit, that good or wise. Yeah, you know, I, I could eat three cakes. I could eat more if I tried. Uh, but is that the best decision? 
Now, obviously, that's a, a trivial example, but Paul says, I want you to abound more and more in, in love and in knowledge and depth of insight so that you will be able to discern what is best. And I don't think he's making out that you'll be able to discern the right and wrong. Because that should be obvious and clear. You should be doing that anyway. That's revealed in God's word. That's not a wisdom decision. It's just right there. It's plain and obvious that you pay for your cake after you've eaten it. And he's not talking about the, well, I pray you make wise decisions. You, know, you made wise decisions on what to wear this morning. Well done. You know, you have the choice. And you... No, he's not talking about that. It's the what's good and what's better decisions. The wisdom, the discernment, and particularly spiritual wisdom and discernment. So it's not just the saying of no to bad things, it's the saying of no to good things so that we might choose better things. How might I use the time that God gives me, the gifts that God has given me, the money that God's given me? I've got choices there in the middle. I've got right and wrong decisions that are easy to make. I've got trivial decisions that just don't matter. I want you to grow in that wisdom, in that middle section, so that you'll make just not good choices, but better choices. The best choices. And he wants us to do this, for these Philippians to do this, so that you'll be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. Now Sam mentioned that with the children earlier. It's the second time in these opening verses he's mentioned the day of Christ. The day of Jesus' glorious return. He'll come back to it in, in chapter 2, in verses 10 and 11. That Jesus, who has been crucified and raised from the dead and exalted, one day, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He's talking about that big day, the day of Christ's return. The day Paul speaks about in the book of Acts, in Acts 17. For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. He's given proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul says, I want you to be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. You'll be discerning what is best until that day. So verse 6, we saw last week. God will bring you, Christian, to that day. Be assured of that. He who's begun a good work in you will bring it to completion. God will bring you to that day. But this is a prayer that God will enable you to live a life that is more and more like the Lord Jesus, pure and blameless until that day. You see, that day of his appearing dominates these early verses of Paul's letters to the Philippians. It ought to dominate our thinking and our life. And yet so often it's, it's cast aside with the culture around us that doesn't want to think of a day when all of history is wrapped up and the Lord Jesus comes again. But the day of his appearing should dominate not only our lives, but our love and our thinking and our behaviour, that we're, we're ready for it. That's what Jesus urged us to be. We don't know the day or the hour, but be ready. Be ready for that day. He wants us, Paul, in this prayer to be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. That We're not, we're not guessing about when. But we're getting ready for that day so that we'll meet him face to face. We'll be more like him. That the words he used there that we'll be pure and blameless. That, that we'll be more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. See, this matters, doesn't it, for our everyday living? That we live in a way that is pleasing and honouring to God. That we will choose the good things so that we might be pure and blameless until that day. So he's praying that their love would abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so they'll be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And all of this will, well, it'll glorify God in their lives. Paul prays that God would be glorified. Verse 11, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. He's, he's not wanting to pray this so that we can go, look at these Christians. Look at these shiny, happy people. Aren't they beautiful and wonderful. No, it's, it's as, as we're made more like Jesus, it brings glory to God as we reflect a, an element of the beauty and majesty of our Father in heaven, that our lives so wonderfully lived are for God's glory, not for our own. How's that going to come about? Well, he uses an agricultural illustration of that you'll be filled with the fruit of righteousness. He wants to see a spiritual harvest in them. He wants to see the fruit of the Spirit evident in their lives. 
May you be filled with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. May that fruit of the Spirit be ever more evident in us as Christians. Isn't that just what Jesus taught us? I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And later on he went to say, this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So, so as we bear the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we bring glory to God. Uh, as God is working in and through us, through the Lord Jesus Christ, by the power of his Spirit, we bring praise and honour and glory to God. In other words, our lives make much of him. We enjoy him and bring glory and praise to his name. <coughs> course that's perfectly seen in the Lord Jesus that's why he says here it will be filled with the fruit of the spirit that comes through Jesus Christ so as we look to the Lord Jesus and his perfect life his words and his thoughts and his actions that we might become more and more like him did you follow through the logic of that prayer he wants them to grow and mature as Christians so that their love will increase so that they'll be able to discern what is best We'll be wise about the decisions that we make in life so that we can be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with this fruit of the Spirit that brings glory and honour to God. What a prayer. What a prayer to pray for one another. When you don't know what to pray for each other, wow. If you can't think of anyone else to pray, pray that for me if you've got nobody else. What a great depth and content of prayer. You see, when we come to pray, we pray those things that Jesus has taught us. We pray for those who perhaps have got facing difficulties in life and are very obvious on our prayer list. And then we come to others, perhaps, in the prayer diary and go, well, what do I pray for them? Pray these things for one another. Pray these things for your friends in the church. Pray these things for the church in our country. Pray these things for missionaries that you know. Pray these things for other Christians right around the world. Pray these things for yourselves. So that we might grow in that love and knowledge of God and bring glory and honour to his name. Perhaps this morning, think about one of those things, even one of those aspects that you think, oh, I'd really like to pray that for myself. Maybe it's praying that your love might grow and abound and flourish. Maybe it's praying that you'll make good choices. Because you've got the right and the wrong button down and you, and you don't really worry about the triviality, but you, you, you're not so good at the good choices bit. Maybe it's praying that your lives will bring glory to God. Maybe one of those aspects for you would be stronger this morning and you'd like to say, Lord, would you do that work in me? Or maybe this morning as we come to share bread and wine and we'll have a time of, of quiet reflection and prayer, you'll have opportunity to pray that. Pray that, pray, pray this prayer for, for others, perhaps quietly in your hearts, but maybe pray that particular prayer that God would do that work in you, that you might bring glory and honour to his name. Well, let's do that now as we bow our heads and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can approach you as our Father in heaven. And Father, thank you for your great love for us that is seen and demonstrated in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that our love might be more like your love, so that we can grow in our love for you and our love for others. And Lord, we pray that you'll give us wisdom to discern what is best, that we might lead lives that are pure, that are blameless, that are more and more like the Lord Jesus, looking forward to that day when he comes again. Lord Jesus, we pray, come. Come, Lord Jesus, come quick. And Lord, as we long for that day, as we look for that day, may we be filled with the fruit of righteousness, with the fruit of your spirit. The fruit that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, as you are the vine and we are the branches, help us to remain in you. That our lives, both individually and collectively as a church, may bring glory and praise to your name. Amen. Amen. But well, before we come and share bread and wine together this morning, we're going to sing again. We're going to sing the song, Here is Love, Vast as the Ocean, that takes us to the cross of Jesus on the Mount of Crucifixion. Fountains open deep and wide through the floodgates of God's mercy flowed a vast and gracious tide. Grace and love like mighty rivers poured incessant from above and heaven's peace and perfect justice 
kissed a guilty world in love. Let's stand as we sing together, here is love. those who are trusting in Christ alone for our salvation. If you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, then please come and take and eat the bread and drink the wine this morning. If you're not yet a believer and you're thinking about it, just let those things pass you by, think about the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ that this, this bread and this wine symbolises this morning. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to 1 John uh, this morning as we come to uh, the table. to remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel. 
in 1 John and chapter 1. We read, we hear these words. This is the message we've heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him, yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in our lives. It's the blood of the Lord Jesus that purifies us from all sin and as we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and forgives us our sins and purifies us from all unrighteousness. Isn't it wonderful Jesus Christ out on the cross? It is finished, as we sang earlier. His work is completed. The price has been paid. And you and I come, knowing the forgiveness of our sins. As we take and eat the bread this morning, we'll be reminded of his body nailed to a cross for us. As we drink the wine this morning, we'll be reminded of his blood shed for us. That purifies us from all sin. Let me lead us in prayer this morning. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, even this morning as we're taken in heart and mind to the foot of the cross, as we see our Saviour Jesus wearing a crown of thorns, with a sword that has pierced his side, with nails in his hands and his feet, we see his life laid down for us. We see your love demonstrated at the cross. Lord, as we picture that in our mind's eye, we see the, the body of Christ given for us. We see the blood that has been shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, our, our hearts are filled with anguish when we think of the cross. Because Christ was rejected. Yet our hearts are filled with thankfulness. Because at the cross of the Lord Jesus, we know the forgiveness of our sins and everlasting life. Father, thank you that you are faithful and true to your own word. Thank you that we know that as we've confessed our sins, you have forgiven us. As we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for our salvation, we know that we have everlasting life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you, Lord, that nothing and no one can snatch that from us because you have us safe and secure in your hands. So, Lord, we come to share this bread and this wine together this morning with thankful hearts, with grateful hearts, with joy. And we pray, Father God, that our lives will be lived to the honour and glory of your name. Lord, we're humbled as we eat bread and drink wine this morning. We're grateful and thankful, we're rejoicing, but we're humbled that you would be mindful of us, that you would choose us as your children. Lord, we give you praise and glory and honour for your goodness and grace to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Hear and accept our prayers, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's join together in prayer. The prayer's up on the screen. It's familiar to us all. It's the Lord's Prayer. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus did this simple act of breaking bread and 
saying, take and eat this in remembrance of me. And we'll do that this morning. Please take and eat the bread as it's passed round to you so that we can give thanks to God as we remember the Lord Jesus Christ. same way after supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes i'm going to pass around the cups please hold on to them until we've all been served so that we might drink together perhaps as the cups being passed around you might take the opportunity to quietly pray in your hearts to the lord Together we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. <coughs> Father, we thank you for these simple reminders of bread and wine. We do this in remembrance of Jesus, longing for that day when he comes again. Lord, we pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are not able to be with us this morning. For those on holiday, may they be refreshed by the break that that brings. For those away preaching, for, for Brian and for Miles, give them strength and wisdom as they proclaim your word this day. For those who are not able to be with us because of ill health, Lord, we pray that you would draw near to them, that you would give them great hope and wonderful peace that comes only from you. Lord, for those who've wandered away, we pray that you would as the good shepherd draw them back lord we pray that for all of your people whether we're here together this morning or, or listening online 
or at home today, we pray that we would know your grace and your love and your mercy this day. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And to close our service this morning with uh, some words from Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 verse 20 says, May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will, that he may work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for coming this morning. Please do stay for tea and coffee. Uh, we'll serve to the back in just a moment.